There's been a lot of talk online in the last few weeks about how Sony is leaving behind the A7 S3 and how people are talking about switching to the A7R5, the FX3 or even the newly announced ZV-E1. In this video I'm going to talk to you about why for me the S3 is still the absolute king for video in 2023. Despite this camera being nearly three years old it still does absolutely everything I want it to do from a video point of view. I invested a lot of money in this camera so why would I want to take the hit and swap it out to something like the FX3 or the ZV-E1? Well the truth is I wouldn't. I am more than happy with this camera and this is a camera that I can see myself sticking with for quite a long time to come. Basically it's just got everything I need from a video point of view. It's got fantastic 4K, it's got 120 frames per second in 4K, it's got 10-bit color, it's got amazing autofocus, it shoots stills, the low light capabilities in it are absolutely insane. I mean, this is a shot I shot handheld. So, I mean, show me another camera that I can shoot that handheld on. It's robust, it works in basically all weathers, all temperatures, all conditions, and the image quality and color reproduction and everything else from it are everything I need. There is literally nothing Sony could offer me now that would want me to change this camera from a, from a video perspective. I don't need 8K video. I don't need 12-bit color. Both of these things offer nothing that would give me any advantage in what I do. They just give me disadvantages in the fact that they create huge file sizes. I've got enough issue with data wrangling as it is without needing to increase that even further. There's nothing they could do with this to make me switch. Actually, there is one thing, but I'll come on to that a little bit later on. Now, a lot of negative talk about the Sony a7S 3 has come about from a new firmware update that's come out for the FX3. Now, Sony isn't famed for their firmware updates and they've taken quite a lot of flack over the years about their lack of updates to existing cameras. So this is quite a nice change for Sony to actually provide further features for a camera quite a while after its initial release. But like I say, people have been absolutely raving about this FX3 update and have actually cited it as a reason to potentially change from the S3 to the FX3. The main three standout features are a full DCI 4K readout, which means it uses the whole of the sensor for the readout, whereas in this it's kind of limited to a 16 by nine ratio, which is kind of cuts out the bottom and the top slices of the sensor. Um, you'll notice when you go from stills mode to video mode that the letterbox closes in slightly and that's basically what that means. You get the full readout on the FX3 now. There's also anamorphic de-squeezing, so if you're using anamorphic lenses, you actually see on the back of the camera what you are shooting rather than, I don't know how to describe it. I've never used anamorphic lenses and I'm not likely to. Um, there's loads of stuff on YouTube and Google about it, so if you are interested in that, just have a look at those. There's also true 24p filming, and basically what that is, when, when you are filming in 24p, it allows you to set your shutter speed to one over 48, which is double the frame rate, which is basically the rule for shooting. Your, your shutter speed should always be double your frame rate for that basically true 24 frames per second readout. I mean, that's not something I would ever notice the difference in, so it's just not something I'm interested in. But for people that are using like proper cinema cameras, like an FX6, an FX9, or a Sony Venice, a lot of these people have an FX3 as a B cam, so to be able to use that as a proper B cam in the exactly the same modes as the, the bigger cameras is a, is a massive thing. So this is a really good update for those people, but for the way I shoot and for the content I create, I've just got no interest in these updates at all. My knowledge of these things and that more in-depth level of, of filmmaking is quite limited, like I say, because of what I shoot and how I shoot it. So. I might be wrong here, but they seem like fairly low level updates. They seem like things that Sony could implement into this as well, but for whatever reason have chosen not to. We'll see if that happens in the future, but they're not something that are like, oh, well, that makes me definitely need that. And I think that will probably apply to a lot of content creators as well. Obviously there are gonna be some guys, like I say, that will make use of these, but for me, I'm just not interested. So I'm still more than happy 
with this and they're not a reason to upgrade to the FX3. At the end of the day, the FX3 and the A7S3 are still using the same sensor and they still have very similar video performance. So why do I prefer this? Well, I did actually use an FX3 a few weeks ago on a shoot in Scotland with Nigel Danson and you can see the video I shot for him in the link here. Um, and I did actually use the FX3 for some of that. It's a great camera. I love the size of it. I love the form factor of it. Unfortunately, I've got no footage of me using it just because of the conditions we were shooting in. But there are three main drawbacks for me of the FX3 over the S3. And the first one is that the smaller body means that they need to implement cooling into it. And the FX3 has big vents in it. Now, as someone that shoots outside most of the time in rain, in wind, and a couple of months ago on a, on a very sandy beach with a lot of sand blowing about, these vents seem like huge traps for moisture, for sand, for things to get into the camera. Now, I think I have seen that Sony says they are weather sealed, but I, the amount of sand blowing around, I would not want to be having a camera with big open holes in it like that because that is just a recipe for disaster. The S3, I know from experience and from what Sony say is weather sealed. Um, and I've used this in like minus 10 rain, snow. I've used it on a sandy beach. I've used it in all kinds of conditions and it just keeps working. And having that confidence in your equipment is really key. I couldn't have that confidence in the FX3 because of these big vent holes in it. So that was a major drawback for me. The second major one is this, it's the EVF. And this is such an essential tool to the way I shoot. Because I'm outside shooting all the time, like I say, in a lot of different weather conditions. I often need to shoot quickly. So I'm shooting handheld, I'm not using a tripod. And this gives me a third point of contact. And that is absolutely essential for keeping the camera stable. If you, you just got two points of contact, you can keep it relatively stable, but having that third anchor point means you can hold the camera so steady. And the FX3 not having that was a real drawback for me. I found I found it really tricky not having that. It also helps, like, even though Sony are so good at producing screens, the screens on the camera still aren't as good as some of the other options out there, like on Nikon cameras, for example. I find the EVF a lot better for just checking focus when I'm manually focusing. When you're using it in bright conditions as well, if there's bright sun shining on the back of the screen, I find it really tricky to be able to tell exactly what your exposure is, where your focus is. So having this to look through and shield out the sun is a really key thing to do. And the third drawback that the FX3 has that this doesn't is the ability to take stills. Now you might be able to take stills in the FX3. I didn't actually get as far as checking that out but because this is basically a video camera in a kind of mirrorless photography camera body taking stills is really easy yes they're only 12 megapixels but being able to quickly switch out fire off a few stills in the middle of a shoot to support whatever you're doing is a really key thing for me to have but do i see myself owning a more cine style camera one day probably the last video I shot was a bit more of a documentary style and I see myself getting more into that kind of thing as I move forward in my career. So one day, yeah, maybe I will own um, a cine camera, but it would be something bigger like an FX6 with built-in NDs that the FX3 hasn't got and just more options for inputs like sound, XLR, things like that. Um, like I said, the FX3 is a brilliant camera, but for me, this is a better camera for how I shoot and that is primarily outdoors and very reactive. And the points kind of apply to the newly announced ZV-E1 as well, which is kind of dubbed as a camera for, for the new creator. Someone that's shooting themselves, someone that's shooting videos for YouTube, for TikTok, for Instagram. It's essentially got the same sensor as this, again, um, in a smaller body with more limitations. But again, the, there's no EVF and the EVF is so crucial to what I do. Now, I said earlier, there is one thing Sony could do to improve this to make me switch. And that is basically the stills performance. 12 megapixels is not a lot of megapixels in 2023. It's absolutely fine for Instagram. And there's so many tools online now that you can use to expand the resolution of your images. Um, the AI tools within Adobe and other programs as well can basically help you make a 12 megapixel image a lot bigger which probably isn't ideal for printing big and stuff like that. So yeah, the, the main thing I'd want is a bigger sensor in terms of megapixels, but a bigger sensor in terms of megapixels 
comes with its disadvantages and that is basically what they've done in the a7r5 there is a 61 i think megapixel sensor in that and it allows for the camera to have the exact same video capabilities as the s3 but with two major drawbacks one of them is the low light performance the more megapixels on the sensor means the megapixels are smaller so they let in less light so the low light performance on the a7r5 is a lot worse than on the s3 it also means that the r5 cannot do 120 frames per second in 4k because it cannot cope with that level of data throughput so there are two things that this does that the r5 doesn't that are kind of again they're key to how i shoot i need the low light performance and i need the 120 fps otherwise it hampers how i shoot so switching this for an r5 isn't an option this as a video camera is better than the r5 the r5 does have better autofocus capabilities but the autofocus capabilities in this are amazing and they're enough for how i shoot so this still wins as far as i'm concerned spoiler alert i need two cameras for what i do and i do have an r5 and i'm shooting on it right now and it is an amazing thing to have in my bag i'm using the r5 more than i'm using this because when i'm shooting in the middle of the day or basically after sunrise or before sunset i don't need the low light performance but i want to be able to get higher quality images if I need the low light performance or I need to shoot a few clips in 120 FPS, not too many because you don't want to overdo it, then I pull this out of the bag. And the two cameras complement each other so well that I honestly don't think I'll be switching anything about my setup for at least the next few years. The only thing that will change that, like I said before, is potentially one day getting a cinema camera. So if you need that massive megapixel readout, then yeah, maybe opt for the R5. But if you are solely a video shooter and you want to shoot outdoors, you want a robust camera, you want to be able to use an EVF, this is still the camera to buy in 2023, not the FX3. That's just my opinion. There are people that are going to disagree with that, obviously, because everyone has this different shooting style. The FX3 doesn't suit mine. The A7S3 does. Hopefully that's given you some insight into these cameras and helped in a potential buying decision that you're about to make. I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you want to see more from me on subjects like this and photography and everything else, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up as well because that really helps. Thanks ever so much for watching. I'll see you next time.